it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. This story is based on the song God's Gonna Cut You Down by Johnny Cash. Hurt. Sharp, blinding slits of light hit my eyes from between darkened clouds of pollution and smoke. It's been years since the world's gone to hell, and I've been in the middle of it for so long, and the only one beside me was my one and only companion. I've considered him my brother for so long, and it's paid me well. I don't bother looking over my shoulder or moving my attention as I finally muttered out, dragging my feet against the dirt-battered cracked pavement that was once a highway. Now, it just leads nowhere. Nowhere important, anyways. Most of the highways and main streets led to other opposing gangs and groups that seemed to be more interested in bloodlust than survival. Of course, we were neither of those. We were the ones who kept them in line. Hey! I glanced up to keep my balance, my boots now causing me to stumble a bit every so often as the lip was stuck between the deep cracks. The impenetrable thick clouds of dust and heat made it impossible to be dressed in such a way as we did. Well, I stopped mid-step, stomping my foot that was still in the air. I rubbed my shoulders a bit, the pistols concealed in my pockets clinking and crushing together. Do you think we're ever going to find them anyways? I turned my hair to spit over my shoulder, huffing through my nose with impatience. I heard John sigh, slowly coming to a stop beside me as well. He put a gloved hand on my shoulder, the other hand holding up a small parchment with symbols and scribbles that only he seemed to understand. He let out a stifled laugh, shaking his head. Listen, Ezra, we've been on this same damn highway for about three days on foot. I'm sure we're going to be here for quite a while. At least three of them are in a group together, and they're pretty far gone. Hell, as much as I know, they might be behind us trying to get to us as well. John moved his hand away to pat my back a bit hard, nearly knocking the wind out of me. I smirked, shaking my head. I couldn't believe it. So, <laughs> it'll just be one huge lube like that, I joked, starting off once more down the highway. John shrugged a shoulder, raising a brow. I don't know, but it could be. Listen, it'll probably only be a few days till we get there. If we're lucky, we'll be there by sunup tomorrow, if we don't sleep. Just hearing this made me instantly dread the thought. Going through all this made me want to dig myself into a hole to let all of this blow over. But that was to be expected with such a job as we had. John stuffed the paper in his back pocket as he trudged on, leaving me to stay ahead. I wrapped my fingers around the edge of my gas mask, tugging it down to place over my face, rolling my shoulders once more. Once we get there, we shall be around morning, I'm sure, since uh, I'm not sleeping any time soon. I chuckled softly, pointing a thumb over my shoulder to him, hopefully grabbing his attention. You'll have to realize how important this is to me. I shoved both my hands into my back pockets, huffing through the mask enough to cause the glasses over my eyes to slick up with fog. I held my breath long enough to have the fog thin enough to see at least a few feet in front of me. I'm pretty sure I do, John snickered, shrugging his shoulders up as he flipped his hood over his head to conceal his bright, blonde, almost white hair. He raised a brow, looking up to me with amusement. Ever since I suggested the idea, you were all for it. Yeah, you're right. I chuckled, shrugging my shoulders as well. Ah, don't worry, man, we're gonna... I stopped mid-stride, skidding onto my feet as I noticed something off. John stopped as well, quirking up a brow in curiosity. What? Did I do something wrong? He muttered out, a bit confused. I hissed between my teeth at him to keep quiet, grinding them hard as I jerked my head around. I stared at the ground for a moment, crouching down. Since there was nothing around but desert-like brush, sand, dirt and pavement, well, aside from the occasional few broken cars, 
There shouldn't be anything that moved other than him and I. John did the same, his chest moving up and down with his nerves. I did the same. I slowly reached up to gesture his attention to where I was pointing, nodding my head. In a hushed tone, I managed to mutter out, Someone's here. I can tell. I didn't bother looking to see if John was tagging behind as I slowly walked towards the direction the figure was headed, my palms growing moist with excitement and nerves. As soon as I was a few more steps behind him, he spun around on the heels of his boots, staring directly down to me. I gasped loudly, springing up onto my feet. John did the same, pointing a finger at him. What are you doing? Don't just stand there. He stabbed at me, but I just stared. I slowly reached down to curl a finger around the butt of my pistol, glaring up to the other. I turned my head over my shoulder, but kept eye contact with the man in front of me. John sputtered out a mixed amount of words, mostly nonsense that I couldn't make out, probably because of my indiscreet focus on the new man. Who is he? I muttered to John, but just loud enough so the other could hear. The man snickered, clenching and unclenching his fists. In one hand he had a long, thick silver chain that wrapped round his palm and wrist. One hand empty, but the other, well, the other had a large arrowhead-like blade attached to it. Before John could answer my question, the man chuckled. His large, muscled figure made me seem like a stick compared to him, and John no different. He had several piercings along his bottom and upper lip, several trailing down his eyebrow and cheekbone. His fair tan skin seemed to be bleached between the slits of light from between the clouds in the sky. I narrowed my eyes, him doing the same. He didn't seem surprised as I was, which made me feel a bit uneasy on the encounter. Bam! He slowly began to whip the chain up and down with the makeshift blade slicing through the air, a wide yet sly grin on his face. I took a few steps back, John doing the same. I slowly slid the pistol out and ran my thumb along the side, blindly switching the safety off. I raised the barrel up with one hand, and the other staying at my side. As coolly as possible, I tried my best to stay calm. Now, oh, listen, Ben. I don't want to do this to you. I held my breath, my right eye twitching. But I'm going to have to unless you put your weapon down right now. I barked at him, but his expression didn't seem to be any different than before. If anything, he seemed more amused than intimidated. He didn't stop rolling his chain, but he raised his opposite hand. He motioned for something behind him to come forward, causing me to almost lose my grip on my pistol. I lowered it slowly, but still kept it aimed in front of me just in case. I raised a brow, now curious on who this mysterious secondary right man was. A taller, lanky female pushed past him, dressed in nearly all black, with stringy, long, dark green dyed hair. Her piercing, steel-silver eyes seemed to penetrate through mine, leaving me one on two. She combed her bangs away from her eyes with her unnaturally long, sharpened fingernails, her hips swaying with her steps. In one hand she had a painted-over Glock 19, and on her back, held up with a strap, was the heavy AT-4, which to me seemed that it was already loaded and ready to fire whenever the two seemed that they needed it. And you are? She raised a brow, shifting her weight. She crossed her arms over her chest, sighing softly. I already knew what she was aiming for, to put me off guard. At least that's the conclusion I jumped to. My name isn't important right now, ma'am, I said flatly, raising the pistol up as I stared at the Glock in her hand. She sighed softly through her nose, flipping the hair from her eyes. Sweetie, there's no use to hiding. Everybody knows your name, you know. She snickered, glancing over her shoulder to her partner in crime, shaking her head. She seemed to have some sort of tick about her, like she was hiding something. But, well, I set that idea aside. You're known as the modern bull around here, sweetheart. She giggled, shrugging her shoulders. 
And that's why we were sent to find you. She looked back towards me and her smile grew ear to ear. Oh, uh, I can't kill you. Ban nodded his head in agreement, snickering quietly as well. Bahu. I shifted my weight a bit, squeezing the handle of my pistol gently. The woman scoffed and rolled her eyes, shaking her head in disappointment. Do you really not remember? She raised a brow. You're on that, oh, I don't know, agenda to assassinate those who oppose the laws of the new world. She planted one hand on her hip, raising a brow. I flashed her a disgusted look. How did anybody know that other than John and I? I, um, I don't know what you're getting at, I muttered, looking off to the side. If, um, you're the people I was sent to, as you say, assassinate, how'd you get so far ahead of us? She just laughed, taking a few steps forward until she was nearly in my face. She pulled the pistol up close. Where was John when I needed him? John, I called out to him, but as soon as I opened my mouth to speak, she shoved the thick barrel of the pistol into my mouth, my eyes growing wide. I heard John a bit further away yell my name, but I ignored it. He was too far away to help me, so I was alone. Quickly, Ban stepped closer as well, coming to a stop with his chain and arrow. He slid his hand up the chain to hold the arrowhead between his index and thumb, holding it up against my neck. I know what your can's up to, he whispered into my ear, snickering. He slowly pressed the blade further, the barrel of the gun slowly pushing further into my mouth. I tried my best to jerk away, but one of her hands was wrapped around the back of my head to keep me still, causing me to squirm violently trying to get away. All I could do was scream helplessly, but that was when I had a sudden urge to keep moving forward. Ezra! John's voice grew louder. It must be closer, I thought to myself. I slowly gripped tighter onto my pistol, raising it up to aim at the woman's forehead. Though she was close enough that our noses were almost touching, I could barely fit the gun between us. The end of the gun was pressed against my forehead, as the barrel was against hers. Ezra, you can't just let him do this. Come on. It almost sounded like an order from him. I closed my eyes tight as I wrapped my index finger around the trigger, inhaling sharply. I tumbled backwards as the gun's whiplash impacted me as much her, a small stream of dark blood trailing from the middle of my forehead down the bridge of my nose and then down to the corner of my mouth. A fine line was just a mere two centimeters deep into my skin on my neck from the blade a small trail of blood trickling down and staining my sunbleached shirt with a dark red. I raised the gas mask to wipe the blood away from my mouth, the heavy taste of iron making me shiver. I lowered the gas mask back over my face, Ban switching his expression from excited to surprised. Nearly tripping over one of the cracks in the road, I hear John stumble forward and bump into me, but I dared not move. I nearly stumbled forward from my dizziness, but stayed on my feet as steady as I could. What are you doing? We gotta go! He pounded against my back and shoulder blades frantically, trying to get me to move, but I was too long gone in thought. No, these are the ones, I mutter, raising the pistol once more. John stopped almost instantly as he heard, nodding his head slowly. I felt him move away from my back, making me aim better than I had. Ban began to swing the chain as fast as he could, throwing it forward and nearly slicing into me. I shoot without thinking or aiming, something that I wished to never do, but had to. The bullet went clean through the right side of his chest. He made a variety of short, cut-off moans and gasps as he dropped to his knees, one hand on the wound and the other on the chains. He looked up to me, and I stared back down to him. I took a few steps forward and pointed my pistol to the top of his head, causing him to start to hyperventilate. 
Oh, God, Ban muttered, squeezing his eyes shut tightly. Ah, oh, must be embarrassing to be taken down like this. I raised a brow, smirking slightly. I pressed the end of the barrel against his head hard, pushing it down against his skull. He gasped loudly as I stopped midway, making Ban more frustrated than he already was. Oh, just, just do it already, he groaned, but I didn't let it happen so fast. I slowly raised the pistol from his head, making him look up to me with confusion. I slowly shifted the pistol from my right hand to my left. What are you doing? He stopped mid-sentence with a loud pain scream as I curled my index and thumb around the bridge of his nose and pressed my fingernails deep into his eyes, pushing them out one at a time. His screams were satisfying, knowing that I finally had the job done and right where I wanted him to be. John tugged at my shoulder hard, but I didn't stop. Stop, right there. This isn't what I needed. He snapped at me, but... He couldn't stop this. I'd been waiting for this for a long time, and now I had him where I wanted. As his mouth was open wide as he'd been screaming, I juggled the two dark jade eyes between my fingers in my gloved hand, shoving both deep down his throat. Well, his screaming soon turned into chokes, but I kept his mouth closed with my hands. I had both my heels on his wrists so he couldn't move much anymore. Well... Some say that this apocalyptic world will get to us. I beg to differ. It makes us stronger. As soon as Barn stopped moving, I slowly moved myself away from him, sighing through my nose. John put a hand on my shoulder, squeezing it gently. I looked over my shoulder to see him, sighing through his nose softly. <sighs> Took you long enough, I chuckled softly flipping my safety back on and putting the pistol back into my pocket. Great job, man. He smiled his same modest smile, crossing his arms over his chest. Listen, I'll get back to you once you have more to do. The boss will be happy to know you got it done. Boss? I raised a brow, doing the same. Was he just messing with me? Who's this boss? I thought it was just us. Oh, you don't know, do you? John shook his head, sighing. He slowly reached up to slide his pale hood away from his head, his white hair shining brightly, his pale skin and bright blue eyes becoming apparent to me. He tilted his head to the side, sighing softly. He slowly outstretched a hand to me, in which I instantly took, in which I hesitantly took. Well, my fingers almost instantly went through his hand. I jerked my hand back, making me jump almost instantly. What the hell? I looked down to my hand, then back up to him. He smiled softly, nodding his head. My expression quickly turned from surprise to fury, clenching my teeth tightly. The only thing that he said, out of a million other things, the thing that made me furious the most were simple five words that would haunt me to this day. I'm all in your mind, Ezra. I am God. This story is based on Like a Stone by Audio Slate. A final goodbye. And I awaited in a local cafe situated above one of the many subway stations that cut their way beneath downtown New York. It seemed like she'd been waiting forever for her beloved niece, Avery, to arrive. It had been so long since she'd seen her niece that... No, she didn't want to think about how lonely she'd been without her. She didn't want to remember the day that Avery had left her, those many years ago. Avery had come to live with Naya at the age of three when her own mother could no longer take care of her. Naya's sister Helen had struggled with her alcohol addiction for years. Naya always had the feeling she'd end up raising her niece one day if Helen didn't clean up her act, and, well, she was right. She claimed the custody of her niece when she was three years old, 
under the instruction of a city attorney. Somehow her niece had gone missing from her life after only two years of raising her as her own child. Little Avery was only five years old when she disappeared into the vast oceans of people and buildings that gave New York its reputation of swallowing faint-hearted people alive. Maya's sister never forgave her for losing sight of her. Now, New York is a big city. Many items have been lost to its streets, parks and alleys never to be recovered. It was a city where things and people disappeared in a flash of a second and, and neither was easily found. Despite this fact, Naya always thought she would find Avery. She always hoped she would see her playing outside one of the downtown shops when she was running errands for the law firm she worked at. Avery would run up to her giggling and Naya would take her home to her apartment where she'd make sure that she would never lose sight of her again. She always imagined that she could see her when she took long strolls in Central Park, engrossed in thoughts about the times they'd once shared together. Now Naya was so mixed up inside. She didn't know whether she was happy or frightened to see the person she loved like a daughter again after four years of being apart. Little Avery would be nine years old now. One of the regulars of the cafe told her that she saw her niece hanging around the lobby a few days ago. Naya had posted her picture on the walls with her name and address in the hope that someone would find her. Well, Avery looked older, but the man who found her niece said he would have recognized her facial features anywhere from the picture she'd posted. Naya came to the cafe every night since the regular had told her the details of her niece's whereabouts in the hope of finding her again. Well, she would do anything to have her niece in her arms after spending so many years apart. She was tired of living her life alone. She was tired of the guilt that she'd been lugging around for five years from losing her. Her sister's inebriated curse words stuck out the most in her mind. I hate that you're my sister. I hate you more than anyone. Damn you, I hope you rot in hell. The drunken words that Helen had screamed at her the night her daughter went missing often played over and over like a broken record in Naya's mind. They made her hate herself more and more the longer she was apart from her niece. She made her want to curl up somewhere and let herself waste away to nothing. She'd felt worthless ever since she'd heard them. She couldn't face her sister ever since the loss in both of their lives had taken place. Tonight the service was slow and when the waitress did speak to her, the young woman with red hair pulled into a ponytail and told her that she would meet her niece soon. Naya had talked to the regular at the cafe who'd originally seen her niece, and said that she'd also seen Avery playing by the subway a few times as well. The regular at the cafe insisted that she'd seen Avery hanging around these parts since last August, but Naya had yet to see her walk through the glass doors of the small establishment. She'd been waiting for her niece to show up for a while now, and somehow found the courage to pull herself out of her depressive haze, if only for a while, at the prospect of seeing Avery walk through the front entrance. Perhaps this evening would be the moment when she could finally own up to the fact that there were some things in this world that were out of her hands and could not be faced alone. Well, she couldn't explain why she was waiting here. She felt completely disoriented. One minute she was driving home and the next moment, well, she wasn't sure what happened. Naya assumed that she'd stopped at this place because she knew Avery would be here. Maybe she possessed some kind of ESP. Naya remembered that her sister told her once that all aunts have psychic abilities that tell them when their family needs them most. That was one of the many things that made aunts special. Helen had told her that gem of wisdom before Avery had gone missing from their lives. Naya knew that her sister would say that all family is worthless if they had the same conversation these days. Well, Helen had lost her last reason to retain some sort of sanity in her life when her daughter went missing. She started knocking back eight beers a night. The last time Naya heard anything about her, she was serving time in the state penitentiary for being caught drunk behind the wheel for the third time. Naya kept drawing a complete blank. She knew that she couldn't be dreaming. She felt the warm air of a heater on a nearby table blowing in her face. 
This had to be real. She couldn't remember when she'd showed up to the cafe. There were other people sitting next to her table. Some were sitting by themselves, looking out the window, facing out onto 12th Avenue, deep in thought. Others are laughing with old acquaintances. It made Naya wish that her niece was sitting at the table with her. After she pictured Avery's brown curly hair and blue eyes in her mind, she saw her walk through the door of the cafe like a vision come to life. All Naya could feel was a combination of relief and excitement. Avery began to talk to her, but she didn't hear the words. An overwhelming feeling of happiness overtook her body. Naya finally worked up the courage to give her niece one of her famous and Naya hugs, ignoring what she just told her. She smiled and took Naya's hand. Don't worry, Ad Naya. I'll never leave you again. She heard Avery say as Naya took her hand and led her out of the cafe to the entrance of the nearby subway station. After receiving a pair of tickets, the two hopped onto one of the subway trains together, holding each other's hand. The subway seemed to travel down the set of old steel tracks for ages as it sped out of the city and cut through the rolling hills of a green valley. Small towns popped up every once in a while. Between each stretch of landscape, Naya and Avery passed on the way to their final destination. On their way home to start a new life, Naya asked Avery where she'd been all these years. With Dad, Avery had replied. Dad took me back and made me live with him. I was so afraid to leave, but Daddy said I'd be all right. He took me to the place we're going. He told me you'd probably be at the cafe if I met you at the right time. I wanted to be the first person to find you no matter what. Naya all at once felt very weak in the knees. Avery's father had died a few months before she was born. Her knees had to be mistaken. Perhaps some man like her father had been taking care of her, but no, that didn't seem right. Naya stared down at her niece, who was smiling up at her. A headache started to form at the back of her head, but everything was starting to become clearer now. It was the fact she'd assumed that she'd stopped at the cafe on her way home from work that got her to thinking. Naya never remembered reaching the cafe in her car. It was as if she'd just shown up there and started waiting for her niece to arrive. It made little sense that they were taking the subway since Naya had supposedly showed up at the cafe in her car, and the two had no reason to be heading out of the city. Naya lived in an apartment not far from where the cafe was situated. She just had to jump in her car and take the freeway to the downtown area and... Hmm. The freeway. Another wave of pain shot through her head as she started to recall all the moments leading up to sitting in the cafe. She remembered that she was driving on the freeway, headed to meet with a cafe regular about a possible sighting of her niece. That's when a truck had started to tailgate her from behind. Frustrated, she tried to go faster, but the truck caught up with her again. This speeding game continued for a while until the truck became impatient and attempted to pass her on the side but he didn't give her enough room and he ended up sliding into the side of her car. The last thing she remembered was a tall, lanky man banging on her car window. He was yelling through the window, asking her over and over if she was okay. She looked around her and saw that her car was turned upside down. For some reason, she couldn't move any of her limbs. She could only hear the man saying that he'd called for an ambulance and to hold on as everything had faded into darkness. And then... She'd ended up in the cafe, waiting for her niece like nothing had happened. Naya felt her emotions wash over her like a wave. She put her arms around Avery and held her for what seemed like an eternity. Naya held her niece for so long that Avery had fallen asleep in her arms. Naya laid her niece gently on her lap to allow her to continue resting. She took her cell phone out of her purse after a while and scrolled through the list of names in her contact list to her sister's cell phone number. She knew she couldn't reach Helen by the number in her cell phone. Helen was locked up behind bars on account of her latest drinking incident, 
and there was no way she could personally visit the state prison to get any message about her daughter's whereabouts to her, now that she'd uh, passed on. Holding the cell phone in her hand, Naya left a single text message on her sister's cell phone, knowing she would probably never receive it. It read, I found Avery. You don't have to worry anymore. I'm going to make sure she's happy from now on. Damn, if Helen's ever sober enough to get her cell phone privileges back, there's a chance she might finally know that I've reunited with her daughter. Maybe then she'll be comforted knowing that I intend to care for Avery until it's her turn to return home. Naya thought to herself as she slipped the cell phone into her purse and watched Avery sleep on her lap as the subway train pressed on far outside the boundaries of New York City limits. After travelling for a few hours, the two of them finally reached their old home in the suburbs, where they'd once lived before Naya had moved to the city. She'd rented a small apartment to have easier access to the cafe people had reported to see her niece hanging around in. It was also within walking distance of her job. She thought about who would take care of her apartment now that she was gone. She wondered what would happen to all of her possessions. It was a strange feeling pondering everything that would happen after she was dead. The subway reached the suburban area where Naya's house had once been located. She assumed that it was her place to get off. She gently awoke Avery and the two stepped off the subway onto the platform. They walked up the street above and made their way to the house the two of them had once lived in. As Naya stood at the iron large gates of the Victorian-style house her niece and she had once lived in eight long years ago, she felt a tear slide down her cheek. It had taken many years, but Naya was finally reunited with the young girl she would always viewed as her own daughter. Her niece continued to hold her hand as the two of them walked through the large iron gates of the property to the house's front yard. Naya smiled when she realized that, from this day forward, the two of them could live the rest of their lives out together in the place made of the landscape of their dreams. It was a year before Helen was released from the state prison, but she'd heard about her sister's death while she was still serving her time. The news had devastated her. She'd once been angry at her sister for losing sight of Avery, but now she couldn't bring herself to be angry at her anymore. For the first time in her life, she was able to accept some of the blame. If she'd just been a better mother to Avery, then she would never have been taken away to live with Naya. She could have prevented the disappearance of her daughter and the death of her sister. They told her that Naya had been driving to follow up on a sighting someone had had of her niece at a downtown cafe. That was when the truck hit her car, and she wasn't able to hold on to life before the medical team of paramedics arrived. Helen had gone through an AA program when she was at the state prison, and was now sober. Today was the first real time she'd had to visit her sister's grave. She was still locked up when the family had held the funeral. Although she couldn't make it, her mother had visited and brought photos and news of the event. Her mother had also told her to think about how her action had led to everything that had happened, and begged her to start turning herself around before she was met with more tragedies in her life. Helen took her mother's words to heart, and had been working hard to stay sober and employed. Shortly after being released, she started working in a small flower shop near the cafe her sister used to frequent. She liked working there because flowers reminded her of her sister. Naya had had her own garden when she was still alive. She rented the same apartment her sister lived in, as it had fallen unoccupied after her death. She visited the cafe every day in hopes that she'd find some news about her daughter. It was an early Saturday afternoon when she took a taxi out to one of the inner city grave sites to visit her sister's final place of rest. She was carrying a bouquet of flowers from the shop she worked in. She would made it specially for this occasion, with all of her sister's favourite candies and even a stuffed bear she knew her sister would like if she was still alive. When she reached the cemetery, she walked along the path until she saw the row her sister's memorial was located in. She walked along the path of headstones until she saw her sister's name carved on a stone that read, In memory of Nia Stevens a loving daughter, sister, 
aunt and friend. She placed the bouquet of flowers at the base of the grave and had a moment of silence in honour of Naya. As she stood praying over her sister's gravestone, she heard her cell phone's ringtone blare from her back jean pockets. In your house, I long to be room by room, patiently I wait for you there. Like a stone, I wait for you there, alone. The familiar sound of the ringtone she'd set for her text message notifications cut through the silence. She considered taking her cell phone out and silencing it, but something told her not to. The ringtone continued to play into the empty spaces around her. And on I read until the day was gone And I sat in regret of all the things I've done For all that I've blessed and all that I've wronged In dreams until my death I will wander on The ringtone finished its final part then a sharp buzz sounded, letting her know that a text message had just been sent and was waiting for her to view it. Helen couldn't explain why she felt so compelled to look at her cell phone. Even though she ignored most text messages when she was doing something important, she felt as though she should read whatever text message was sent her way. She pulled the cell phone out of her pocket and read the text message that had set off her cell phone's ringtone. The message read... I found Avery. You don't have to worry anymore. I'm going to make sure she's happy from now on. Helen put her hand to her mouth in shock. It was a message from her sister. It was dated the exact day and hour that she died in the accident with the truck. At that moment, something clicked inside of her. A deep-rooted instinct of knowing that all of her deepest fears had come to pass. She somehow understood the meaning of her sister's last words. She wasn't going to see Avery again. Not in this plane of living. Not until she crossed over into wherever death had taken two of the most cherished people in her life. The realization that Naya and her daughter were together gave her a mixed sense of peace and sadness. She was at peace because she knew her sister would take care of her daughter in the afterlife but she was also sad that she would never get to see her daughter alive in this realm of existence again. Helen sunk to the base of her sister's grave, grasping the cell phone in her hands. She held the cell phone close to her face, with her sister's last message displayed on the screen, and wept at the base of her grave for what seemed like forever. Well, there are a few things in life I enjoy more than the music of Johnny Cash. And nice to couple that with um, one of my favourite audio slave songs as well. Now, are you getting bored of these? Please let me know if you are, because um, I'm quite enjoying it, doing these uh, rock song-inspired creepypastas. But if you're getting bored, let me know. These things can get old pretty quickly. Until you do, though, I'm going to keep going a little while longer. Well, that's it for Sunday. Have a great evening, uh, very, very sweet dreams. <laughs> bye bye till the next time. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.